Good morning, everyone. A couple of quick updates today before we get to your questions. Uh, first of all, some good news on the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. Uh, this Saturday, we'll open up another section of the trail from Wolcott to Hardwick, which will be another 6.4 miles reopened. In total, now we have 79.5 uh, miles of the 94-mile trail, uh, which will now be open. And I want to thank the crews who are working hard to get it uh, up and running. So we appreciate that. Next, I'd like to share what we've learned about uh, those whose heating systems were damaged due to flooding. As we talked about uh, previously, we reached out to about a thousand people who had initially reported damage. Among them, we've heard back now from about 590. And of those 590, 261 reported their systems aren't working and uh, they're going to need someone to help uh, get them up and running, meaning they don't have anyone lined up at this point in time. Uh, we've referred all those in this category to Efficiency Vermont and the Fuel Dealers Association, and they're working on getting services scheduled and to better understand other obstacles uh, these Vermonters may be facing. Uh, that are complicating things. As of the uh, beginning of the week, uh, they've been able to connect with 95 of these households. Uh, 27 of them now have heat. Another 42 are scheduled or are working with a contractor as we speak. The others, as I mentioned before, have more complicated uh, issues that our teams are trying to help uh, them with. And for those they haven't reached, they'll continue to make those calls, and at some point uh, we'll just go door to door uh, when we get the numbers down a little bit further. Um, I want to continue uh, to ask all of you, uh, members of the media, to spread the word. Uh, if you don't have heat, anyone out there who doesn't have heat and haven't heard from us or received the survey, uh, please call 802-828 3333, and that's the governor's office. Now, on a <clears throat> somewhat related note, next week is the annual Wheels, Wheels for Warmth event, uh, which will be in its 18th year helping Vermonters in a number of ways. Uh, we started Wheels back in 2005 with three goals to collect perfectly good tires no longer in use and make them available to those in need for pennies on a dollar. To raise money, a second, uh, um, the second point was uh, to raise money for those in need to help heat their homes. And third, uh, to clean up our state by recycling old tires that can no longer be used. Uh, Vermonters can donate their good used tires or pay to dispose of tires no longer safe to be on the road next Thursday and Friday from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock at the following locations. The Vermont Granite Museum in Barrie, Casella Waste Systems in Williston, Casella Construction in Menden, and the Stowe Events Field from 1 to 5. And then on Saturday, October 28th, tires will be on sale from 8 a.m to noon at the Granite Museum in Barrie and Casella Construction in Menden. As a reminder, um, this is a true non nonprofit. 100% uh, of the money raised will be split between the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity, or CVOEO, uh, Brock out of Rutland, and Capstone here in Central Vermont to help fill the gaps in heating assistance for families. And I want to thank all those who donate their tires, uh, the many sponsors of the event, and most importantly, all the volunteers who work so hard year after year to make this happen. As a reminder, since we, we launched this program, we've raised over $670,000, recycled over 50,000 tires, and resold over 25,000 tire, tires. Over the years, uh, we've had support from hundreds of volunteers, totaling thousands of volunteer hours. Again, it wouldn't be possible without them, but it also wouldn't be possible without tires. So take a look in your garage, your basement, or your shed, 
and ask yourself if you're really going to use or sell the tires that no longer fit the, the uh, vehicle you're presently driving and consider donating them to a wonderful cause. It's a great way for folks to help out their neighbors, get back to their community, and keep Vermont a little bit cleaner and warmer. So I look forward to seeing many of you at next week's events. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to General Roy. Thank you, sir. Good morning, all. Uh, just some quick updates uh, for today. Uh, as of today, we've actually hit the $22 million mark for individual assistance uh, for uh, uh, and we've had 6,165 people apply for assistance. Uh, as we mentioned last week, we did extend the uh, individual assistance registration period to the end of this month, the 31st of October. Uh, and we continue to see day after day uh, other people uh, signing up uh, for assistance, as well as visiting uh, the disaster recovery centers. And we still have two open. Uh, last Saturday, we closed the Waterbury Center uh, permanently, uh, and this coming Saturday, we'll close the one in Ludlow, and we'll maintain the one in Barrie uh, through the end of the uh, assistance period. Um, and again, the deadline to apply is October 31st. Um, don't wait. Uh, we've had a long open period, uh, but we are still seeing people apply, so the word is still getting out, so thank you for your assistance in that. Uh, to apply for assistance, visit disasterassistance.gov or 1-800-621-3362. Um, with regard to direct housing, uh, FEMA determines if applicants are eligible for the direct housing based upon how much damage they have to their home or apartment. Uh, FEMA contacts those who are eligible, uh, so they don't need to opt in. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we will contact them. As of now, there are 253 households that have met the criteria for direct housing assistance, right? And as of now, we're working between 30 and 40 who have expressed interest. Again, between 30 and 40 have expressed interest in it. The remainder have found other resources or are interested. Um, they can uh, contact us and go back into the queue for assistance uh, should their circumstances change. Uh, we have assessed 321 separate sites for possible direct housing placements, um, and we, uh, we maintain contact with those who are eligible for direct housing to check in to make sure that they continue uh, to have a good path forward. Some quick numbers. Uh, as of this morning, uh, we still have uh, 333 uh, FEMA personnel here in Vermont. Uh, 6,165 residents have applied for individual assistance. As mentioned, uh, we have uh, dis uh, approved over $22 million and uh, actually dispersed $21.9 million in assistance. Um, the FEMA staff have completed 9,867 calls to the applicants, and that has resulted in an additional $6.38 million dispersed. Our partners at the U.S. Small Business Administration have approved over $23.9 million for 501 separate loans to homeowners, renters, and businesses. Uh, for public assistance, we have 210 applicants and 713 projects um, with uh, an estimated $142 million uh, in damages, and that's still uh, continuing to grow as we meet with each of the applicants. Um, and that's what we have to offer today. Subject to any questions, sir? Thank you, General Roy. Uh, with that, we'll open up to questions. Governor, you mentioned, uh, I think there are like uh, 160 people who have not been contacted with the heating systems. Uh, they need help, but they haven't been contacted. Have you reached the point where you need uh, out-of-state contracting help to bring people in? Not at this point uh, that we, we know of. Uh, and again, those those uh, folks that we haven't contacted, that haven't been able to reach, uh, may have rectified their problem. We just don't know at this point in time. So uh, this we we were able to glean uh, their their names from the initial response right after the, the flooding and so forth. So they may be all set. We just don't know that yet. So. 
everything looks like we're we're okay, um, but um, but if we get uh, an influx of people and we can't take care of it, uh, obviously we'll be reaching out to others for help. But but right now it's, it seems as though we have uh, the workforce uh, to accomplish this, um, but but we don't know what we don't know. Uh, we just need to hear from people. This may be a better question for Peter Walker. I know he's not here from Efficiency Vermont. Do you have any idea with their whole rebate program, do you guys kind of partner with how many people have participated in that or use that program? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a great question, but I, I don't have the answer to that. But we can we can either reach out to Peter or uh, maybe do so directly. But but it'd be interesting for us to have that information. And we may have it somewhere, I just don't, I don't know. Willie, you said I think uh, 6,600 people have? 6,165, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, and of that group, how many have actually gotten some reimbursement, do you know? Or does that include all those people have? Uh, so those are the actual applicants. Um, pardon me while I put my reading glasses on, sir. Uh, so the actual valid registrations, uh, so 6165 is the total people that have applied. Um, and we have 131 of those who have applied but are from non-declared counties, like Addison County, for instance. Um, and um, we have, I think, referred over 4,588 people, I think, to, uh, for assistance. Uh, of one sort or the other, uh, either individual households and program or direct uh, housing assistance. Are we able to come up with a number that says sort of on average applicants uh, have $6,879, sir. <laughs> 6879 okay. Is That doesn't he, sound like a lot. Um, well, we have 55 people who have received the 40, total of $41,000, but you have some people who may have only needed uh, clean uh, an, an assist uh, program, um, so it really depends on on you know their status. And and, and to reiterate, you know, over nine thousand phone calls from our team here resulted in another six point eight million dollars. So, you know, that's why we continue to say, you know, if you have expenses, please contact us and and uh, see if we can assist you uh, with updated uh, your status and providing different additional funding. Thank you, sir. To, to Bob's question there, and maybe this is, I don't know, Secretary Samuel, Samuelson's on the phone, the governor's going to answer, but are, are we seeing an uptick in people reaching out to social service organizations or food uh, help or rental assistance? I'd imagine, to Bob's point, 6,800 isn't a lot, and for some of these people, rebuilding probably is a big challenge. I mean, are, are you seeing an uptick? I, I don't know if there is an uptick in regards to those who have been displaced due to flood. I'm not sure about that. But Secretary Samuelson, is she on? Did you hear the question, Secretary Samuelson? Yes, yeah, so I appreciate the question. Um, we are we are uh, working to tease out whether any upticks that we're seeing right now are the the typical and traditional seasonal upticks that we see in some of our economic services programs and how much of the impact is on the flood. Um, at this point, I, ca I can't tease out those two parts um, to, to answer it specifically, but we can get back to you. Governor, a letter you signed with, with a number of other governors <coughs> calling on Congress to act in terms of aid to Israel um, is said that each state uh, increased security in Jewish communities and that Jewish houses of worship. I don't know if you could elaborate on that in terms of what you've done in Vermont. Uh, yeah, I know our uh, Vic uh, Vermont uh, Information Center um, has been actively involved in that. Uh, we've reached out to, to the rabbis and, and some of the Organizations uh, directly, uh, Vermont State Police has, and uh, in other um, areas of opportunity uh, where we want to make sure that we're remaining vigilant and uh, making sure that Vermonters is safe. So uh, I can have somebody. I don't know if anybody from public safety is on at this point in time. Uh, Commissioner Morrison, is that something you can elaborate on? Well, I think you covered it pretty well. 
Vermont Intelligence Center has been sharing communication out into the field. Um, and as you said, Governor VSP has made outreach through our uh, fair and partial policing team as well as local station commanders with some of the houses of worship that might be impacted by world events. Um, and we have encouraged local police and sheriff's departments in those communications to do the same in their communities. Um, there's uh, <laughs> obviously that everyone is feeling a heightened sense of um, concern for security in these places uh, and although not relevant to the situation today we have seen a couple of inquiries come up for one of our homeland security grant programs that's specific to um, security needs at houses of worship so we do we do have resources that places can be connected to to apply for the next available round of funding to uh, up their security measures have there been any specific events or incidents of anti-Semitism uh, in recent months or weeks? Not that I'm aware of. Governor, I have a question about the Farm Bill and some of the programs that are associated with that. As you know, we have the emergency FEMA aid that was approved by Congress, but there's still a few big spending bills that are still outstanding. Are you aware of any programs that are in jeopardy or programs that were not uh, getting money for it right now that uh, as a result of Congress not having a speaker? I, I'm not aware of any, but um, but maybe Secretary Tebbets can answer that. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, just a little background. Of course, the Farm Bill is, is critical. It's up for, re for reauthorization uh, this year. Uh, there is a deadline that is approaching. Um, a lot of the talk out of Washington is trying to get an extension of that uh, if they can come together in Congress on um, on that. So it's kind of wait and see. Uh, right now, nothing has changed. Uh, but if they do give an extension of the farm bill, that will give us a little more breathing room before they get a final bill, uh, which is historically is never um, passed on time anyway. And sometimes it, it takes up to a year for them to come up with a final bill. The Farm Bill is a, a five-year blueprint uh, that establishes uh, many programs, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's hunger programs, whether it's the commodity programs in in USDA. Just a just a tremendous amount of work and and resources come from that Farm Bill. So we're just patiently waiting and, and hoping. Uh, but um, the extension is the first thing, and then after they get the extension and then maybe a full farm bill coming next year. Governor, I, I know you're not on the ground in D.C., of course, but what, what do you think of what you've seen play out over the last week, two yeah. weeks, with the speakership structure? Well, it's concerning on a number of different levels um, and disappointing uh, and embarrassing in some respects. It seems as though it, it, would, it gives our adversaries, um, I think, uh, uh, room to to uh, plan. I mean, when you have so much dysfunction in, in one area, we can't even agree on a, on a speaker, a uh, leader of uh, of one body um, over a two week period. It shows that you don't have your act together. It shows weakness, I think. Um, so, I'm concerned about that. But it, but as well, the practical aspects. I mean, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we need some help in Congress with a number of different initiatives. And uh, we need them to, to come together and figure this out. I, I've said before, I think I said it in one of these press briefings, uh, if I were the moderate centrists on both sides of the aisle, I'd figure this out and, uh, and gain control because that's who should be controlling uh, Congress at this point in time, those in the middle, those on both sides of the aisle who can work together and, uh, and get some things accomplished. Are you saying that you think there's an opportunity for moderate Republicans to work with Democrats? Because right now the Republican caucus has flatly ruled that out. They don't want to have anything to do with the Democrats. Well, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, that the leadership of both parties would say the same thing. Um, but I would say if you were able to, I think the bulk of, uh, of Congress in some respects, I mean, there, there, is, a, there is a stronghold. I believe, of, of moderates and centrists in Congress 
who can actually are actually there for the right reasons and uh, and want to get things done and make things better uh, for Americans and for their states. And uh, and I do believe uh, that uh, there's enough of them. If there if five if five members of, of the Republican caucus can shut down uh, the, the Congress in some respects, it seems to me that there's more in the, in the middle uh, that can that can do the same and, and actually get it back going. So I don't know if they're going to do it, but from my perspective, that's what I'd be working on. And maybe they are. I don't know. What does this tell you about the state of the Republican Party? I think it, it's not just the Republican Party, um, because you have the other side as well. I mean, there's nobody coming across saying, you know, I'll vote for that speaker just to get things going. So it takes two. Um, you know, bipartisanship, uh, I've said this before, everyone wants bipartisanship, uh, and they, they talk about that, or it seems like a, a lot of people do, uh, but it's a one-way street for many. Uh, it takes two to be bipartisan. So everyone's got to reach out, everyone's got to come together in order to accomplish that. It, it, to me, it's about the polarization of our country and, uh, and politics in general. And I'm not, it's not associated with one single figure. It's just the way we've evolved and the way we receive information. Uh, I, I, I believe that whether it's uh, the, the media, I'm not blaming any of you, but, but, but you, anytime you want to confirm your beliefs or what you're thinking, you just have to change the channel and you'll get it, right? So, so everyone keeps doing that and then we get isolated. So we don't broaden our perspectives, listen to one another and we get more polarized. So it seems like both our country and the world is getting more polarized. And uh, we gotta, we, we've got to figure this out and bring ourselves together um, because we as a country are much stronger. We're Americans first, and uh, we're much stronger when we're working together. Governor, we reported this morning that uh, a Weinberger for Governor website is under construction. Any thoughts on facing Burlington's mayor in the next election, and, and are you planning to run? Well, I haven't. Uh, I haven't made a decision on whether I'm going to run or not. But um, I'm sure there are a number of people who would like to aspire to be governor. And you know, I think it's good to have choices. Uh, this morning, Global Foundries, or it was at least released this morning, Global Foundries was awarded thirty-five million dollars to continue their chips for aerospace. I guess just in your opinion, if it is, how important is Global Foundries to the state of Vermont, whether it's workforce and just kind of keeping Vermont in that national landscape of yeah. creating such important technology? It's, it's, it's really essential for us. They are a major employer for us. Maybe not to the degree that IBM was at one time, but still a major employer. And this puts us on the forefront. Uh, this, again, we need a diversified uh, economy, and they're a major uh, part of that diversified economy. Uh, and a lot of it, you know, enhances our trade with Canada. A lot of ships go uh, to to Canada, and um, it's all good for us. So I'm uh, very pleased with that. Back on the uh, election question, understanding that you haven't made up your mind, uh, in the event that you did run, do you give any consideration of not running as a Republican? Given the sort of state of politics yeah. in this country, you know, I think I've I've made my um, made my mark in politics in terms of always being someone uh, who's willing to listen, reach across the aisle. I like to see uh, that in return. Um, but um, but but I've been a Republican since I got started in politics. I don't believe at this point in time that there's any sense in me uh, changing uh, parties or doing something different? Um, but I, I do believe that we need we need more centrists and moderates involved in politics on both sides of the aisle, uh, and it's going to take people having the courage to do that and to uh, to call out even their own party uh, when that happens. But but it's not just Republicans, as I've said. I see the same thing on the Democratic side, you know, with the progressives and so forth. And the left, uh, far left, uh, versus the far right. So we all have to uh, to figure out how to make this work better. 
as you weigh the uh, considerations of whether or not you're going to run the game again, how much of a factor is what the Democratic majority at the state house is moving towards in their agenda, and how you feel that uh, it's really not an affordable agenda? Yeah. Uh, that you feel that you have a need or a responsibility to run again in order to try to keep things in yeah, check? Yeah, that weighs on me heavily. Heavily. In what way? Well, I think that uh, I do have a responsibility. You know, I, I, I take that responsibility seriously, um, and I do think the, the legislature is moving in the wrong direction at times, uh, spending much more uh, than we're taking in, and, uh, and I think it's leading us uh, to a more unaffordable Vermont, and, and I, so I feel some responsibility there, um, but I'd also like to drive again, so I'd like to have my life back. So it, uh, you have to weigh those two things out. We'll go to the phones. We have a few on there. Let me come back to the room. We'll start with Lola Von Digger. Hi. Can everyone hear me? We can. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to the subject of the uh, Israel and Hamas war. Um, Governor, you and other governors sent a letter to congressional leaders um, on October 16th calling for the quick passage of increased aid to Israel. Uh, the letter condemned Hamas's, quote, despicable acts of war and terror, but made no mention of Israel's violence against Palestinians. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you condemn that, that violence as well? I, you know, I see this um, as a situation where we have a terrorist organization uh, that is overseeing Palestine, uh, but it's they're a terrorist organization, and uh, so our our fight, their fight, Israel's fight with uh, uh, is with Hamas, uh, a terrorist organization. So uh, there are, I mean, I'm I'm very concerned about the innocent victims, uh, Palest uh, Palestinians. Uh, as well as uh, Israelis and, and the Jews in Israel um, and across the, the country, for that matter. Uh, but in this case, Israel is our friend, our ally, and uh, they're faced against an, a, a terrorist organization. So we need to support them wholeheartedly and uh, make sure that we're, we're there for them as they would be for us. Right. I mean, you know, you've... Uh you know, you, part of your, I think what you're no, well known for is being willing to uh, criticize your own party, right? Criticize your friends. Um, and I mean, do you think that Israel has acted correctly here in, I mean, blockading a territory of two million people, half of which are children, um, and blocking food and fuel to that population? An Israeli airstrike just you know, it's a school in a refugee camp. I'm just looking at rooters here. Um, you know, are none of these actions worth some condemnation? I think the horrific acts we saw with uh, Hamas uh, coming in and uh, taking the lives of uh, innocent, innocent women, uh, beheading of babies, um, killing elderly people, uh, in a barbaric way was enough coming and invading uh, Israel in that way uh, is enough for us at this point in time. Hamas is a terrorist organization. Now, President Biden is there now uh, to address the humanitarian portion in Palestine, and I'll, I'll leave that to him and others uh, to try and work their way through that. Uh, but we do have a humanitarian um, responsibility as well, I believe. And I think he's there at this point in time to try and address that. But that doesn't so, mean that we don't support our ally and we don't support uh, the eradication of this terrorist organization. So um, would you support USA, U.S. humanitarian aid to Palestine? Yeah, I think that that's going to have to be part of this. We have to make sure that there's a pathway, and I believe that's what uh, President Biden is there for at this point in time, uh, to make sure that there's a an exit strategy uh, for Palestinians. Right. 
I mean, you know, on the subject of that exit strategy, the UN, the evacuation orders that Israel gave, you know, this kind of unprecedented evacuation order that they gave has been widely condemned by, you know, the the human the human rights uh, community, right? Human Rights Watch, um, the UN has called it quite literally impossible. Um, do you? Do you think Israel erred there? Well, again, I think that's what President Biden is doing there now, trying to bridge the gaps, pull people together, and uh, make sure that there's an exit strategy uh, so that we can protect innocent lives and, and uh, we don't lose more. Um, but I don't think that Hamas had given much warning uh, to their attack on Israel either. Um, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. This has been a really interesting political discussion. I have a more prosaic question. Uh, Thank thankfully, Governor. yes. Um, <clears throat> as I under understand, and maybe it's changed, but is the, the, the FEMA aid still at 18 months? The, is that, it's, the 18 months, I'll let General Roy answer this correctly, but I'll take a stab at it. The 18 months started at the day of the event and goes from there. Um, so we're already, you know, a few months into the 18 months at this point in time. General Roy. So I, and, and I was, I was run, wondering, General Roy, that the state would have to request an extension to, say, 24 months. Is that... Is that the way it works? Yes, sir. Uh, if the state uh, deems that the the individuals that were assisting in the direct housing program have no path forward at the 18-month mark uh, or prior to it, uh, the state can request uh, that we extend the program uh, and to a, a, a later period of time, up, up to 24 months. And, and the, well, and I'm sorry. And the 18 months started uh, at the date of declaration, which was the 14th of July. So um, I'm wondering, uh, Governor, why why wait to ask for an extension since you know that the rollout of the direct housing program, especially the trailers, has been um, you know taking time. It's going to take a bit more time, and that 18 months will expire in the middle of next winter, not this coming winter, the next winter. Why not ask the extension now just to you know have that that program in place? I think we'd have to substantiate uh, the reasoning behind the extension. So at this point in time, we don't, we don't, I don't even know for sure how many will be um, in that housing program to even start with, uh, much less how they would be, you know, come spring, um, getting through the winter. They may have other opportunities. Uh, they may be back in um, their their own homes. They may have other other options. Um, so I think we have to substantiate it. So I, I couldn't, in good conscience, uh, ask for an extension when I'm not sure that we are going to need it. Now, if we need it, uh, we'll ask for it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Governor. I just wondering what, this, what that situation is. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Governor, uh, some latest surveys, and there are plenty that conflict with this as well, but there are a lot of them that say that uh, less than 50% of the American public intends to get uh, their COVID booster this year, uh, given that they feel the risks are not as great as they were during the pandemic. Um, I know that uh, the health department has uh, uh, switched over to a non-emergency reporting system. I was wondering if Dr. Levine, as holidays approaching, will be joining you for any press conferences to sort of unpack what the future looks like in terms of Vermont, given its success with the vaccination program uh, during the pandemic. Yeah, I'm, we haven't talked uh, specifically about that, but uh, I saw Dr. Levine the other day, and he'd, uh, I'm sure he'd be willing to come back in and, and talk about that as we enter flu season and COVID season. Um, so. So yeah, I think uh, he'd be. We'll put that on the, on the idea um, list because I think uh, 
I think it would be good to have him come in at some point to talk about that. But it is, you know, I will say, uh, Tom, this has, you talk about the, the lack of interest in some respects of uh, being vaccinated for COVID. Um, as you know, I, I had mine, but this is now becoming more like the flu. And uh, with the flu vaccinations, we don't, we don't see the numbers we saw with, uh, or the interest that we saw with COVID uh, vaccinations either. So I think in some respects, it's just getting uh, more, uh, more of a, a common, uh, I guess, in some respects, uh, with, has more in common with the flu uh, than it did before. Uh, it also made us curious to take a look at if, if you go through the uh, our, our health site for the state, the number of places where you can go and get a vaccination while still uh, pretty abundant compared to during the pandemic is just not in everybody's mind all the time. I'd be curious to hear what the health department thinks of that. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have Dr. Levine in at some point here to talk about that. Much appreciated. No other questions. Keith, the Rotten Herald. Hi. Uh, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour ago, the, uh, the Rutland City Mayor made a post to his Facebook page talking about uh, the increase in crime in the city, specifically uh, around repeat offenders. He called them uh, people who get sort of arrested for something and then let out not long after, and then they re-engage in the same behavior they got arrested the first time. Um, he's talking about having some kind of forum, I think, in early November. I'm just curious, um, you've got a Democratic mayor in a city saying, you know, we got a real problem not putting people in jail or having any services after that. I'm um, just kind of wondering if you've talked to the leadership in Rutland about this. I don't think this is unique to Rutland, but um, just I don't know, what do you think about this? Are you hearing anything on this? Or? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know what party affiliation uh, he is. he is in Rutland. I don't know if that's a party-affiliated uh, election, but but anyhow. Um, but I have spoken to the mayor uh, about this issue. Uh, we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about a number of different issues affecting Rutland. Uh, he came up uh, here, and um, and I'm I'm supportive of uh, some of what he has uh, been talking about, uh, and this is one of the areas where I agree. Uh, we need to to make sure that. Um, that uh, people are held accountable, uh, that we can't just keep letting people go um, and uh, repeat offenders. There has to be some repercussion. So we'll be having more conversations as we get into the legislative season uh, to talk with legislators about that, just that. But it'd be, it's helpful uh, to have uh, him uh, in his new role as mayor uh, to talk about it as well. Thank you. I mean, do we have an idea why that practice is happening? I mean, I, I have noticed it does seem the courts are less less inclined to hold people for any length of time, whereas in years ago that wasn't the case so much. I don't know. I think it's a, I think it's a legislative uh, initiative. We've we you know it's it's happened evolved over time uh, as well. It's not just the courts. It's it's the legislature. So we just need to come to some conclusion here and I and I do believe that people need to be held accountable enforcement has to be part of the solution and um, in everything that we do and I think we've lost lost sight of that thank you Chris Roy Newport Daily Express Yes, good afternoon, Governor. Um, we've had a couple of serious crimes up here in the Northeast Kingdom the last several days. Um, a couple of homicides, one in Newport Town and one in Wheelock. Um, excuse me, not homicides, suspicious deaths, I think, corrected. Um, could you comment on that? Any um, thoughts about that? Well, again, obviously concerning. We're not sure if they're connected or not. I'll, I'll have the commissioner. Um, um, talk about this a little bit as well, but um, uh, but but we want to make sure that people, if they've seen something, say something. I think that's important. 
Uh, the one I believe in Newport uh, is uh, we, we believe that it's it's drug related, um, and I'm not sure about the one in Wheelock. So, uh, Commissioner Morrison, is that something you can comment on or give us an update on? Um, well, sir, I can say that there there's no indication that they're related. In fact, we're we're quite confident they are not related. Uh, and I would direct folks to, to the frequent updates and communications that our public information officer puts out. Um, and any specific questions about either of those cases should go to VSP. I don't want to get ahead of them on release of any information. But as well, I think we're uh, we're asking people if they've seen something, um, and particularly along uh, Route 16, I believe, in the Wheelock area, if um, they have any information, they should they should present that to the uh, the Vic. I think is that what we're asking. That's correct. Um, we have received uh, numerous pieces of information, and we put up a request asking for. Uh, folks to tell us if they have trail cameras or home security systems that might uh, shed any uh, images or give us any information about that stretch of roadway when, when, uh, in, on Route 16 in Wheelock. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the room. Governor, last week you talked a, <clears throat> a, a lot about resiliency. Um, maybe, maybe that was two weeks ago, I'm not sure. But, um, do you do you have any? We've talked about these big, long-term sort of rebuilding upriver and letting more water flow. Do you have any specific ideas for next legislative session? Lawmakers are already working on a bill to put some money aside. What? what how are you thinking about this session? Well, again, I think some of the big projects we're uh, thinking about would take congressional action and support. Um, so uh, another reason we need a speaker. Uh, in the uh, in the, the house, um, but um, but we have obviously some ideas in terms of and, and some you know it's not just ideas we we've been doing them uh, for the last number of years when we we rebuild uh, we have we have a lot of, uh, of uh, money in terms of uh, transportation um, so we'll be incorporating all mitigation efforts into all the. The money that we're receiving uh, as a result of, of many initiatives along the way. So um, there's a lot of money available uh, that we're is coming to Vermont, and uh, and we're going to use that and make sure that we're hardening ourselves, mitigating uh, future flooding uh, as a result. So it's in every project that we do. Anything you want to add to that, Secretary Flynn? Thank you, Governor. Um, I would just reiterate that resiliency is not a new topic. As the Governor said, we've been working on this, uh, frankly, even before Irene, but I can tell you I was in Irene, as were many. And since Irene, we've increased those efforts. I think you heard Secretary Moore say that last week. An example I'll give you is if you go to Vermont Route 131, and we'd even arrange a media tour if you'd like, the damage sites that you'll see between Downers Corners and Cavendish are sites that were not damaged and not built back better after Irene. The sites that were built back better after Irene withstood. So that's just one example. If you go further up the road toward Cavendish, you come to the intersection of Wrightsville, Whitesville Road. That bridge was damaged in Irene. That bridge was not damaged. I've been at both of those sites as I've been at most of the sites since the July and August storms. So along with what you heard previously about the Waterbury State Office Complex and numerous other areas, we have built back better. We have had an eye on resiliency. Every storm is different. Every place is different. So we can't say that we're going to get every place before the next storm. But the idea that resiliency is just a current conversation, uh, I don't think gives credit to the effort that's been ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Flynn. Governor, October is LGBTQ 
plus um, History Month. Vermont's obviously made history in multiple facets, whether it's sending Congressman Rebecca Ballant to D.C. And you've always talked about wanting to be an inclusive state. And I mean, this legislation passed this past session has been a part of that. But I guess just do you have any other things you would like the state to do or communities to do just to kind of keep that going in this historical month? Yeah, I mean, this is an opportunity for us to, to showcase our openness, our, our willing uh, to to be more tolerant of everyone. And uh, and I think it's a way for us uh, to welcome more people in the state, which we desperately need. Um, so anything, any ideas out there that people have, uh, I would encourage them uh, to come forth and, uh, and celebrate the month. Thank you. 